Good morning, guys. I'm Deep Procrastinated here. The topic of today is earthquakes, and specifically the earthquake risk in New Zealand, and even more specifically, the earthquake risk in Wellington, New Zealand. So let me give you a very brief bit of history and a little bit of understanding with regards to tectonic plates and the dynamic environment that New Zealand is situated in. So let's start with a couple of big earthquakes. Well, let's go back to the 1850s, which pretty much decimated Wellington, New Zealand. Um, the, co- uh, the first colonists that were over there building up Wellington City uh, were shocked to find that when an earthquake hit of approximately magnitude 8, which was the wire wrapper fault, ruptured, it completely leveled Wellington, New Zealand, and changed the landscape so much so that certain features of today would not exist had it not been for that earthquake, like the Wellington International Airport, and the certain features that would have existed that don't exist, such as the new port that we're looking to build, which is actually the Basin Reserve. So there's a couple of important facts here that I'm going to quickly throw out that you'll probably need to keep in your memory, which is 1850, large earthquake of 8.5, and tsunami of about 1.5 meters at the time, and all sorts of risks associated with living in New Zealand, such as um, we live on a plate boundary to the right, to the east. If you look at the map that I'm going to put up here, so just to confirm, I'm putting up some images here to keep you um, up to speed with things. There's the Pacific Plate, which is an oceanic plate, which is more dense than the typical, uh, it is more dense than the um, continental lithosphere, which is the uh, Australasian plate in this instance, which New Zealand actually sits on. So those two plates interact, and they create some important fault features. They create, in fact, all the fault features across New Zealand, um, some of which are probably more easy to um, discuss, such as the Alpine Fault being one of the largest, uh, the Wellington Fault, the Wairapa Fault, the Hickoringi Trench, the Ohario Fault, and there's a couple of other fault systems that I can't quite remember. The, in fact, there's lots of fault systems that I can't quite remember the name of. But that also relates quite well to the Christchurch earthquake, the Kaikoura earthquake, that we all had in the last 10 years. Now, when I talk about the Kaikoura earthquake, I'm going to bring that up just for a moment, and also the Christchurch earthquake. The reason for that is the Kaikoura earthquake um, brought about a significant advance in our understanding of the interaction between different fault planes, different faults, fault systems, not just in New Zealand, but in the world. And the reason for that is scientists have quite extensively studied Kaikoura and the different faults associated in the Kaikoura area. And who would have known that when the earthquake happened, um, I think it was about a year ago, uh, maybe a year and a half ago, that they would have caught all this on their monitoring gear. They actually had all their monitoring gear. They never expected to catch what they did. And when the Kukura fault went, multiple faults ruptured one after the other after the main fault went. That has never before been recorded. So, that helps with our understanding. And then we go back a few years, back to 2011, 2012, Christchurch had a significant, in fact, they had two significant earthquakes um, about six months apart. And the most destructive being, I think it was in, was it February 2011 or February 2012? It was one of those years. Uh, Apologies if I don't got the date correct. And uh, the second was the most destructive because it's closest to the CBD. And typically, earthquakes that are shallow do the most destruction. So, to give you an example, if you had a magnitude 6 earthquake at, say, 100 kilometers depth, you'd probably find it doesn't do much damage. However, if you take that same 6 magnitude earthquake and you reduce the depth to 8 to 12 kilometers, you pretty much have near utter destruction. So that's also another key thing to understand. When we're just talking about earthquakes in general, understanding the depth relationship, the magnitude relationship, is quite important. Anyway, right, 
So now that we have a couple of things out of the way, the risk in New Zealand at the moment in Wellington is we have four different fault systems. Typically, actually, we have five, but I'm going to talk about the four well-known ones, which is all in parallel to one another because they're all ultimately related fault systems. Um, so on the right, you've got the wire wrapper fault. On the left of that, you've, and they're all to the left of the wire wrapper fault. So on the right, furthest to the east, you have the wire wrapper fault. Then you have the Wellington fault. Then you have the Ontario fault. And then you have one other, which I forget the name of. And they're all related. And then from the left to the right, the uh, unnamed fault is expected to be a magnitude of around seven. The Ohio is a seven, seven and a half. And this is just through carbon dating and understanding previous movements across the fault that they can do through geological history. And the Wellington Fault, somewhere between an eight and a half and a nine. The Wairapa Fault, well, the Wairapa Fault back in 1850 was expected somewhere around about 8.5. 8, 8 and then there is one that's really interesting, which is effectively the subduction zone, the trench system itself. So I'm going to show you a diagram here so you can understand what a trench is. A trench is effectively the deepest place in the ocean, but it's only the deepest place in the ocean because of a couple of important key facts. The interaction between two plates under a plate under a subduction, specifically at a subduction boundary where the ocean oceanic plate is subducted underneath the continental lithosphere. So, looking at the image, we can see that because of this interaction between these two plates and the way the force is distributed and the density difference between the two different types of plates, we have this thing called a trench system. Now, the problem that we have in New Zealand is the Hikarangi Trench, which effectively is the plate boundary between the Pacific Plate and the Australasian Plate, and that follows from the top, as in the image, the Hikarini Trench, all the way along uh, east of Wellington, flicks round and kind of merges into the Alpine Fault System. Now, a recent article just came out that we had an earthquake, quite a small earthquake, just the other day, a couple of days back. So the date today is the 29th of the 11th. Uh, 2017 and what that helps scientists realize is that the Hikaringi Trench where typically you would potentially get a lot of activity deeper down but also has the potential to create a massive tsunami such as in Japan because they're typically a reverse fall thrust system what that means is we now have confirmed a more su substantial risk to Wellington, New Zealand, where most of the risk has been a fault uh, associated with closely related faults, such as Kaikoura and Snedden. I haven't mentioned that one. But, the, of course, the Wellington, the Wairapa fault, the Ohio fault, etc. So what that means is that living in Wellington, New Zealand, can be rather scary because we have all this risk around us. Now, to put it in perspective, the destruction that would come, I don't care what anybody says, the destruction that would come from a magnitude 8 or above earthquake hitting the CBD directly would be very significant. The, the structural rating of Wellington buildings in New Zealand have a high code of standard. However, that high code of standard is associated directly with a moderate earthquake risk. And if you look at the definition of what a moderate earthquake risk is, you will actually see, and this is going from memory, apologies, I'll put a link in just to confirm exactly what that is, but I believe it's a 5.5 to 6.5 earthquake. 
Now, to put it in perspective, the Kaikoura earthquake that hit was a 7.2, again, from memory, apologies if I get that off a couple of points, was approximately a 7.2, and it was approximately located 400 kilometers away, and again, from memory, it was about 10, 12 kilometers depth. That did significant damage across the Wellington region. We had buildings that failed, not completely failed. We didn't have any buildings that physically collapsed, but we had internal portions of the building collapse. Um, car parks, their lift structures collapsed. Ultimately, we had to re demolish multiple buildings in Wellington and Lower Hutt due to the significant damage sustained with that earthquake that was a considerable distance away. Now, if we'd taken that earthquake and had a direct hit, let's say the Wellington Fault didn't go, but let's just say the Ohio Fault went, which is slightly smaller than the Wellington earthquake, and probably more comparable to what Kaikoura generated. We have to be careful, there's lots of different physics that take place with regards to the um, seismic waves and how they travel through the ground, where they come from, how fast they're going, etc. And how fast they're going really is related to the type of rocks they have to travel through, the material they have to travel through, um, what, what the buildings are built on, is it reclaimed land? So in other words, loosely compacted ground versus a bedrock, which is um, far more capable to sustain large seismic waves traveling through them. And um, yeah, anyway, I'm not gonna get into that. So if that had happened, I'm just gonna say, we would have seen a completely different story. We would have had multiple casualties, probably multiple buildings would have collapsed. Why? Because we only have a standard where buildings are built to 100% being the standard at maximum 6.5 earthquake. So to understand what the code actually means, the code is there to provide stability to buildings so that they do not collapse. In other words, they may sustain considerable damage, but they will not collapse with the, aid, with the intention to prevent the loss of lives in a moderate earthquake range 5.5 to 6.5. Again, check the link below just to make sure that those are accurate figures. So, uh, many buildings are built beyond the code, so 130%, 150%. But of course, a lot are below the code. And we probably need a good 10, 15, maybe more years to bring every building up the code. However, there is significant work there. So look, the long and short of it is, I love Wellington, New Zealand. I love New Zealand. I love the people. You know, we have low crime rate. We have great people. We have fantastic culture. So I guess the question is, is all that worth it for the potential risks sitting there festering away in the background? Let me know what your thoughts are, guys. MC Procrastinator out.